Thank you very much, Tom, for that kind introduction uh, and for the invitation to speak today. Um, and thank you all for being here. I know many of you were eagerly looking forward to Mark Meyerson's talk. And so I'll start by apologizing for not being him. Uh, I know yeah, that uh, he was going to talk about something wonderful. Um, I'm kind of surprised this being California that like something couldn't have been worked out with Mark Zuckerberg and Meta or something, um, an avatar of some kind. But in any case, uh, my talk is somewhat different, I think, than what his was going to be or what I imagine it would have been. And I'm, um, you know, starting out not as a erudite and learned social historian, but as something of a kind of a humanist flaneur and professional dilettante. And so rather than speaking like he was going to do about uh, a revision of social history in the Jewish communities post-1391 Valencia, I'm going to uh, speak about some ideas I have about maps instead. Um, but I think it raises a point that he was going to explore, which I hope to repeat, which is how geographical specificity can matter a lot when we talk about religious communities and the buzzword identity. And so uh, beginning with that idea, I'll start a century before 1391 in a galaxy far, far away from Valencia with the journey of Florentine Dominican Ricoldo de Monte di Croce to the Holy Land when he visited Tabriz uh, and Baghdad where he heard with distress the news of the fall of Acre in 1291. When Ricardo finally returned to Italy around the year 1300, he penned two works in quick succession. Let's see if I can show you what those are. Both works were intended to equip future missionary friars in their upcoming pastoral encounters, but the two texts would face radically different fates. The first, an anti-Muslim polemic known as the Contra Legum Saracenorum, against the law of the Saracens, would end up as one of the most cited and influential Christian texts about Islam in the Latin world, spreading wildly in many copies, as many as 31, and culminating with its promotion at the Council of Basel in 1454, and its publication and translation many times over, including Seville in 1500-1501. And then finally, its translation by Martin Luther in the 16th century, a translation which, interestingly enough, was retranslated in 2001 by a pastor from Missouri. So it's still in print. Go get yours today. Ricardo wrote the second work, however, the Libellus ad Nationes Orientales, Little Book to the Oriental Nations, apparently in quick succession after the Contra Legum. But it would end up receiving much less attention and still remains unpublished today. Yet this Libellus, this little book, offers us an interesting point of departure. Rather than focusing only on Islam, the Libellus takes up the broader landscape of religious diversity that Ricoldo encountered in Mongol-controlled Baghdad, including a section on Christian heretics, specifically Nestorians and Syrian Jacobites, a section on Jews, a section on Tatars, or Mongols, and a list of general rules for missionaries in encountering them. Beginning in the prologue, he offers a meditation on Psalm 19, 119, 155, he says, salvation is far from the wicked. And thinking about this pithy verse, he adds, it does not say how far, either because the wicked are so distant that they cannot return without God's benevolence or because the distance is not the same for all. For some are far, some are farther, while others are farthest. More interesting still, this is quite you know, penetrating, but uh, this measure of salvation in terms of distance, of space, corresponds for him inversely for what he calls or seems to liken to convertibility, the facility with which each group can be successfully converted to Christianity. So just as the Jews, quote, seem to be more distant from true Christians than Christian heretics, so Muslims seem to be more di distant than true um, from true Christians, then true Christians, then even Jews, and Tartars or Tatars and pagans, Tatari Siwi Pagani, are more distant even than Muslims. But most interesting of all, by contrast with this, 
what he calls the effect of nearness uh, and conversion, quantum ad effectum a propinquationis et conversionis, he adds, it is completely the opposite in this case. Tatars are more easily converted than Saracens, Saracens more easily converted than Jews, and Jews more easily than these heretics. What interests me about this fascinating observation is that it employs a spatial metaphor to conjure spiritual identity, placing everybody he knew about on a sliding scale of truth based on their apparent propinquity to Christian belief. So my intention today is to make use of this observation as a little starting point to explore a broader question that I believe is germane to the, what we're talking about today, our discussion of mechanisms and trajectories of ethno-religious interactions. And that question is how religious identity, whether individual or communal, can be cast in spatial terms, how distance can serve as a proxy for heresy and infidelity, and how the language of borders might serve to mark perceived differences. I'd like to probe the implications of the metaphors of geography. So this lecture will offer reflections on the use of spatial language in the study of medieval religious contact and change, including above all, religious conversion. It will consider how polemical debates sometimes made use of spatial or directional metaphors, and how conversion is often cast as a departure or a migration, a movement between or across spaces. I want to ask both what role space played in these medieval expressions of belief, but also what role spatial metaphors have come to play in our own historicization of religious phenomena. Sources relating to medieval religion offer us, I think, a stark interpretive choice, one in which we can respond with something like interpretive humility over what we can and cannot know about experience, or one in which we can succumb to the hermeneutic temptation to try to fix the contours of religious phenomena like a cartographer might fix the boundaries of a space. I suggest that we should be mindful of how spatial metaphors can impose a conceptual uniformity on understanding that glosses over the particularities of local circumstance. In looking at religious encounters in the past, I think we must find a way to interpret and employ metaphors of contact and change without falling into the conceptual trap they lay before us. So to begin, how do medieval sources make use of space as a metaphor of belief and identity? Of course, the question is already too ambitious for my modest capacities, absurdly ambitious for the brief moments we have at our disposal today. So I'll start by excusing myself and referring you to any eager, any eager listener to the number of enlightening texts that I was drawing from and thinking about this from Eldon's The Birth of Territory to Jean Dangler's Edging Towards Iberia or Akbari's Idols in the East, and perhaps best of all, Travis Zada's Mapping Frontiers Across Medieval Islam. But the biography aside, since I started with Ricoldo, let me go back to him and note the revealing fact that in his claim that each group of heretics, Jews, Muslims, and Tatars, quote, seems to differ more from the last, magis videnta distare is the verb he uses, the verb distare has the meaning of both to be distant from and also to differ from. In this, Ricoldo's logic, uh, of this, of the, in this, Ricoldo's logic says that space is not an empirical quantity, but an index of something like mythical quality and movement across this metaphorical space closing the distance between true Christianity and its shades of otherness is a form of spiritual transformation or a kind of categorical travel. Michel Foucault, who obviously is no medievalist, but youthful because he thinks a lot about space and actually called himself in some, time, some cases a cartographer as well as a genealogist, calls medieval space, quote, a hierarchic ensemble of places, places sacred and profane, protected and exposed, urban and rural, super celestial, as opposed to celestial, unquote. If we doubt his judgment or capacity to pronounce on the Middle Ages, let's recall the topography of Dante's Divine Comedy, the nine Cerchi of Inferno, or the seven Cornici of Purgatorio, or the nine Celi of Paradiso, all hierarchic ensembles par excellence. These are, in Bakhtin's words, chronotopes, manifestations of time in space, and the time here measured is that of conversion. 
the soul's journey from sin to salvation. That Ricardo should invoke this conceit of space as spirituality is actually not surprising at all. After all, he seems to have written his words precisely in 1301 in Florence, not a decade before and in the same place, Dante began thinking about the Commedia. Apart from these coincidences, the top way of spiritual difference as physical distance, or simply of salvation as a physical journey, is entirely commonplace. It's not only in the context of conversion that this formula holds, distance is a marker of difference in cartographic terms as well. Hic abundant leones, here lions abound, says the top edge, indicating east, of the 11th century cotton MS Tiberius BV1, probably copied from a Roman model. And later legend recasts this admonition to watch out for lions in the famous but apocryphal, partly apocryphal phrase, hic sunt dracones, here be dragons, which actually appears on an astrolabe, interestingly. But this wording also only appears on the Hunt Lennox Globe of 1510. And more recently, based on the Hunt Lennox Globe, the so called ostrich egg globe that Stefan Missine has dubbed hopefully the Da Vinci Globe because he thinks it was made by Da Vinci. To be sure, we know pictures of dragony beasts do enliven the borders of medieval maps, as in the 13th century Psalter world map obviously familiar to many, but it bears remembering that these distant monsters are not in a known territory in many cases. They are in a sort of terra incognita, as Ptolemy's geography would have it. Such unknowns are key parts of medieval spatial understanding. We're obviously all familiar with the common TO maps of Christian thought that divide the world into the zones of Asia, Africa, and Europe, giving uh, each one to one of the sons uh, of Noah, including Ham to Africa. This scheme is presented, of course, in Isidore's later De Rerum Natura, sorry, De Natura Rerum. But while the earliest version of this text, the text of Isidore, is dated to the late 7th century manuscript here, this is the earliest copy we have, it presents a simple tripartite structure of this division without commentary or mythologi mythologization, I can say that. But a ninth century addition to this on the same, in the same folio uh, added here, includes, according to Genesis 9, the names of the sons of Noah. This is on the next page. The Isidorian scheme, embodied and expanded, came to be included in the Beatus Mapai Mundi, some of which, uh, maybe 14, have come down to us, beginning with the rectangular Morgan Beatus the earliest from the 940s. And part of the mythologizing here involved the contemplation of this unknown space we see on the side. At the far right of the Morgan map beyond Ethiopia, we read in, large, uh, in, in a large blank space spanning Africa and Asia, quote, the neighboring desolate land is hardened by heat and is unknown to us. Anthropologist Mary Helms studying the cultural value of distance, has proposed that in many pre-industrial societies, quote, geographically distant places, peoples, and experiences are perceived within essentially supernatural or cosmological contexts, unquote. More recently, Adam Nobler has applied her insights to the Middle Ages or tribe and proposed that we use the term, the power of distance in medieval sources to denote the effect of amplification of imagined military or political power corresponding to distance from the world's imagined spiritual centers. So with dragons and lions on the brain, we might rename this the monstrosity of difference, the heightening of strangeness as a factor of remoteness. In either case, the effect of distance is not premised on sharp definition, but on increasingly vague uncertainty. That is, difference as distance has no fixed border. It lay empty or partly known somewhere beyond the pale, but not firmly bound by it. To be distant was to be different, and also, at least in part, to be undefined, to be borderless. At the opposite end of the Icomene, the known world, difference and distance existed in a sort of dialectical tension with the familiar and the inhabited. Or as Alfred Hyatt has put it aptly before modern cartography, quote, Terra incognita was land unknown, but not unthought, 
And medieval Iberia was, in a way, the gate out of medieval out of the Mediterranean and into the world of the unknown, a sort of bastion at the outer edge of the known world, a wall between the known and the monstrous. The broader fact here is important to stress, though, medieval cartographic borders, such as they were, may have signaled, say, differences of kinds, like differences in climate zones that we've referred to following Macrobius, or differences in lands and peoples, as we've started to refer to in the Catalan Atlas of 1375. And this map synthesized legends from Marco Polo's Book of Marvels and Mandeville's Travels with already existing Mapai Mundi. We've seen these images already today. Likewise, the Hereford map of 1300, drawing from standard depictions of Pliny, Isidore, and others, depicts some 55 creatures from the one footed skiopods to the cyclops to the dog headed cynocephali. But nevertheless, even as these maps sketch out such marvels, they did not exhaustively explain them. To be distant was always to be different, but perhaps counterintuitively, to be undefined and borderless, to be incognita. Numerous scholars have, considering, have considered the history of concepts of territory and affirmed that borders in the modern geopolitical sense of universally recognized demarcation lines separating polities and their respective spheres of action and influence were essentially unknown in the Middle Ages, up to a point. As Ronnie Ellenbloom states, quote, the idea of political borders was very rare in the Middle Ages, and even if such lines did actually exist, they were of little importance, unquote. Ralph Brower affirms almost the exact same thing in almost the exact same words about the Islamic world. Peter Linehan notes that the essentially Iberian border concept of the broad and undefined frontier zone was characterized precisely by its vagueness, a no man's land marking it as kind of a lawless society, quite different from any notion of a modern border as a line. Only a modern abstract notion of legal jurisdiction and rights or sovereign power can support abstract spatial representations of that power and of polity as defined like we see in modern border lines. As geographer Reese Jones summarizes this, quote, before the modern era, there was not a systematic use of bounded territories to signify political claims, unquote. And none has analyzed the implications of this fact for Iberian history more thoroughly than our esteemed colleague, Teo Ruiz, who in From Heaven to Earth argues that, quote, a theoretical formulation of sovereignty cannot be articulated without a grounding of this idea in an imagining or perception of the kingdom as a territorial entity with recognizable limits and boundaries, unquote. This solidifying of borders that came out of a sort of what he calls a new awareness of the measurableness of land coincided with the articulation of an abstract legal notion of sovereignty itself. The proliferation of plots, repartimientos, legal definitions emerged against this background that I've already sketched of medieval cartography defined not by space uh, understood with rational terms, but by theology and myth. The borders of the Catalan Atlas or earlier Mapai Mundi or any number of these contemporary Islamic maps like it are not factitious in any political or social sense. They are semi-mythological regions from the stage of salvation history, punctuated by token natural landmarks, but not defined by them. In this world, we know maps did not attempt to be spatially comprehensive. Of course, they depict a world in un of, made up of unknown spaces beyond natural borders that could be fully known, but also marking out spaces that could not be known. And so borders come to define those spaces that are best known and embraced the fortified city, the walled garden, the house of the faithful. The stark distinction between Dar al-Islam of the faithful and Dar al-Harb beyond is not physical, but conceptual. It too is a spiritual boundary. As Peter Sloterdijk notes in his very interesting trilogy, Spirology, Noah's Ark, as in this image from the Castilian Bible of Moses Aragel, represented a kind of walled city in the void of the sea and was a primeval projection of the covenant God would establish with the Israelites, marking them and their land off as chosen or as bordered and certainly as known 
Medieval borders, like city walls or the hulls of boats, separated the known from the unknown, the inland sea from the encircling ocean, order from chaos or purity from impurity. As the Burgo de Osma manuscript of Alonso de Espina's Fortalitium Fidei famously depicts, truth is a walled fortress with infidelity prowling always looking for a breach. Before the fixing of space through conquest and contact, cartographic maps did not attempt to be spatially comprehensive or geographically mimetic, but instead conjured a world like this, in which the realms beyond natural borders could not be fully known. They were horrible and wonderful, wonders beyond the pillars of Hercules or beyond the wall against Gog and Magog or Yajuj wa Majuj. These things were by definition unknowable and there always were more things in heaven and earth than were dreamt of in human medieval cartography. But, and I think here, Andrew's paper, as he noted, uh, this ideal shifted quickly in the second half of the 15th century. And by the 16th century, with the famous map of Abraham Hortelius's Teatrum Orbis Terrarum of 1570, we noticed something interesting. What had been, Terra incognita now appears, as it says in the bottom, Terra Australis nondum cognita, land not yet known. Before the legal revolution and the fixing of space, medieval borders were, by contrast with this, not tools of sovereignty, indices of expanding knowledge, but rather figures of thought and belief that were dependent on unknowing. In the language of exegesis, they were tropological or maybe anagogical. So if the borders of medieval cartography, as I'm saying, are figural, what are they figures of? Cartographic depictions of the known world and its limits correspond largely to narrative representations of sacred history. And here we see, these are not soteriological uh, ideas. These are soteriological, not geographical. So the movement across such space corresponds to the movement from ignorance to knowledge or from infidelity to faith. In these regions, knowledge and faith did not travel as the modern Eurocentric figure of thought has it from East to West, but across time from past to present. Or as Akbari notes, centrifugally or centripetally, emanating out and returning to the centers of spiritual origin and telos, Jerusalem or Mecca. And here, the Carta Rogeriana of 11th century cartographer Alidrisi, which we've mentioned as well, is much admired for its knowledge, supposed mimetic qualities. And as you see, I put, uh, since South is at the top, I flipped it for you, easier to view. But remember, having been elaborated at the court of Roger of Palermo, it is not typical or representative of medieval Islamic cartography, which instead is better typified, as Karen Pinto has suggested, by atlas maps, the so called uh, Balkhi Istakhri school of maps known as the uh, versions of the Kitab Masalik wa Mamalik, Book of Roads and Kingdoms. Now, although these are not derived from the Isidorean TO tradition in any sense, it's interesting to note that they too end up dividing the world into three, but according to a different myth. So here we can see nearly equal space to Africa and Asia and only a tiny little bit to Europe. Maps of the Mediterranean, as Pinto notes, are often symmetrical and weirdly abstract. And here, comparing maps like these, this is the Mediterranean after all, she makes the interesting and perhaps debatable suggestion, but worth debating, that similarities of maps like these with Islamic diagrams of Christian churches in Constantinople might reflect, as she says, a Muslim view of the Mediterranean as a predominantly Christian space. I'm not sure I agree, but it's worth considering the possibility, at least looking at the maps. But however they're interpreted, as Travis Zada explains, quote, the conceptual borders mapped out in a geography of salvation serve as imagined conceits and thus are not to be found in being, but in language, unquote. And we might add, the topography of faith is our guide. In this sense, figural maps can be construed as visual correlates of another kind of representation of figural difference, one made in narrative terms that moves from past to present or from error to truth. 
And I mean conversion stories. In this sense, just as the known is bound and defined by the unknown, so present faith and identity are bound and defined by past infidelity and difference. It should, of course, not surprise us to find cartography and conversion overlapping. Many stories of conversion are also descriptions or depictions of movements of travel. For example, one of the best known anecdotes of conversion found among the fragments of the Cairo Geniza, that storeroom of documents in the Ben Ezra synagogue you see here, illuminating Jewish life in the Mediterranean between the ninth and 19th centuries. One of the best known of these little fragments of paper is the story of the Norman Christian convert to Judaism known as Juan of Opido, or after his conversion around 1102 with the generic convert name Ovadja Hager. In his brief tale, he says, written in his own hand, we hear tell of a series of prophetic dreams that led him to abandon his native city of Opido and make a new life in Baghdad, Aleppo, and Cairo. He claims this path to, to Judaism and to these cities was prefigured by a story he heard in his childhood about the conversion of one Andreas, the Archbishop of Bari, who also forsook his land, his priesthood, and all his glory, and so came to Egypt. Ovaja too couches his own story in geographical terms. He says, Joram heard the events concerning Andreas the bishop while he was still a youth in the house of Drew, his father. Now, these are the names of the cities around Opito, the birthplace of Juan. This is him speaking. To the west, there are the cities of Rome, Salerno, Potenza, the town of Pietragalla. To the east, the city of Bari. There's the city of Monte Peloso, the town of Genanza. To the north, the city of Acerenza. To the south, the city of Tolve, and so on, and so on for another page. Why? We tend to find the repetition of a geographical motif in the context of conversion stories in many places. Leaving one religion for another entails leaving one place for another, one community for another, or one bordered space for another. As Moshe Yagur of Tel Aviv University has argued about the converts like these in the Cairo Geniza, quote, one of the most frequent descriptions of a convert is as someone who has departed or digressed or overstepped religion, law, or Torah. Is it possible? It is, then, that terms such as exiting and entering, or more generally, crossing of borders, more accurately describe the subjects of this study than the term conversion, so-called. The description of converts with a term related to borders and their crossing, and hence to their social significance, that is so fundamental to the matter of conversion, offers more precision, end of quote. Yagur, like Shlomo Goitain or Norman Gold before him, has chronicled many of these converts in the Geniza fragments. One little fragment tells of a woman in, ninth, uh, sorry, in 11th century Narbonne who converted to Judaism. Quote, she went forth from the house of her father from great wealth and to a distant land. When her husband was then killed, she uh, and her children were taken captive, so she escaped and fled to Cairo. Another fragment tells of Rachel the Rumi, i.e. European proselyte, who writes, quote, my husband, Joseph from Barcelona took me from my land and brought me to Alexandria, and now I am destitute. Another includes an 11th century letter on behalf of a former Christian who, quote, from his youth recognized that the uncircumcised walk in darkness. He sought the religion of Israel and fled to Damascus. The Christian elders there attempted to entice him to return, but he told them their statutes were vanity. He desired to go on and travel to Egypt. So on, these fragments all say the same things. Change of religion is travel. Yet they say nothing about the nuances of belief or faith and focus entirely on the origins and physical movement between communities. But I suggest we're wrong to take these changes of place at simple face value, as though, maybe I'm reading too much Augustine lately, as though they can't be both literal and figurative at the same time. As Lucien von Lira notes, quote, territories and diasporas, the notion of being here and longing for there is, is a constituting frame to understand constructions and reconstructions and contestations of liter religious identities. Undoubtedly, biblical and Talmudic vocabularies of faith and faithlessness are premised on such spatial metaphors. The motif of Abraham leaving or departing as kind of the first convert uh, who then takes his leave is based on the com command in Genesis 12, 1, 
leave your country and your family and your father's house and go to the land I will show you. And early Christian writing obviously evokes Abraham's leave taking as a kind of motif, as when Jesus says in Matthew 10 29, there's no one who's left his house, house or brothers uh, or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake or the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold back. Metaphor, Aristotle says in the Poetics, consists in giving the thing a name that belongs to something else. The language of conversion, no matter the context, is naturally metaphorical because the phenomenon of religious tradition uh, and change, while very real in some people's experience, is also entirely intangible. In scenes of conversion, abstract sense is rendered dynamic through physical metaphor, such as the crossing of distance, a movement but a movement that's both conceptual and physical at the same time. But consider for a moment the wealth of ways that conversion is described in the sources. It is physical to turn or return, say chuv, shuv or chuva in Hebrew, or epistrepho in Greek, or to cast off the cloak of false falsehood, exuere palium falsitatis, or denude oneself of the tunic of iniquity, nudare tunica iniquitatis, both in Petrus Alfonsi. Or it is to take refuge beneath God's wings, or in Arabic, to enter or exit religion, or or as in Samuel al Maghribi or Judah Halevi. Oh. The mixed pedigree here, pedigree of Christian ideals of conversion, as, a bo as both a Hebrew motif of departure and return, but also a Greek motif of the mental turn to truth produced a kind of interplay of motifs of conversion as tangible and intangible at the same time, as both physical and spiritual travel. And as classicist Miguel Herrero de Jauregui has argued, conversion is a spatial metaphor in which one must go from one place, that of error and evil, to another place, that of truth and virtue. This metaphor requires a definition of the point of departure, but also of arrival. So half a century after Ovadia, we hear abundant stories of travel. Herman Judah of Cologne said he traveled uh, on business to Mainz, staying in a foreign house, leading him to convert. The Castilian Jew Abner, of whom I've written a lot, left his hometown of Burgos in 1320 to become Alfonso of Valladolid. New city, new name. And such motifs are found throughout the archive. In the chancery records of the Aka in Aragon, we read of Abner's contemporary Bernat Nadal, it says, let's see if I can get us there, let's see. It says, it happened that the said Bernat was traveling in the region of Bougie and the Barbary coast, when led by a dialogue spirit, he chose the sect of Muhammad, denying the name of the Lord. Similarly, ninth century Frankish convert Bodo journeyed to Al-Andalus to embrace Judaism, where he engaged in a vitriolic debate with Alvarez of Cordoba. Mallorcan convert Anselm Turmeda journeyed to Tunis to profess Islam and take the name Abdallah al Tarduman. And these examples abound because, in a word, travel is transformation. As Maimonides wrote to the convert Obadiah, quote, because you have come under the wings of the Shekhinah that is converted to Judaism, there is no difference now between you and us, something that Judah Halevi would dispute. The theme certainly appears in travel literature. Pero Tafur, in his Castilian travel narrative, Andanzas e Viajes from 1454, describes meeting the chief interpreter of the Sultan of Cairo. He says, he was a man who was born in Seville and brought as a child to Jerusalem with his father, who was a Jew. And when his father died, he turned more. At first they called him Haim, and now they call him Saim. To read these accounts, we might try to combine Bruce Hindmarsh's suggestion that, quote, all narratives are, in one sense, conversion narratives, with Michel de Certeau's observation that every story is a travel story, a spatial practice. The metaphorical rendering of space and place in conversion literature employs what cognitive linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have deemed a directionality metaphor. That is the use of figurative language an image of physical movement to describe an intangible non-physical change. They explain, 
We tend to structure the less concrete and inherently vaguer concepts like the emotions in terms of more concrete concepts delineated in our movement and experience. The underlying argument here is known as epistemological uh, embodied cognition. That is that metaphors are not simply one aspect of human thought or expression, but are constitutive of expression. They are understanding. Certainly in the case of conversion, meaning does not exist apart from its metaphorical trappings. An illuminating example of directionality or the directionality topos in medieval polemical arguments linked implicitly or explicitly to conversion or the expectation of it are Christian attacks on Jewish beliefs that invoke the direction of Hebrew, the right to left direction of Hebrew script as evidence of the apparent contrary or backward thinking of Jews themselves. Daniel Kokin points out that the Isagogian Theologiam by one Odo, active in mid 12th century France, affirms, quote, the Hebrew language descends from the right to the left, just as in contrast with both Greek and Latin, uh, which ascend from left to right. So the fall of the Jews and the rising up of the Gentiles, raising up of the Gentiles is depicted. Such claims were not confined to Jewish Christian debate. In, one so, in the so-called Christian Kasida by 12th century Persian poet Khakani, uh, the, the idea of fate, which he calls Falak, the course of heaven, is said to be unpredictable. Fate is more crooked than the writing of the Christians, he says, that is Greek. The Muslim poet then mocks the Christians, pretending to contemplate conversion to Christianity by proposing a change in his writing direction. He mocks, shall I prepare a Syriac commentary, written uh, from right to left, on the Gospels, from left to right? But then he rejects the idea as changing course of his travels from the Qibla to Jerusalem. He says, I will use the dung of the ass of Jesus to staunch the wounds of the martyrs. I love that image. If crossing borders here represents transgression in medieval polemical and conversionary writing, it is quite the opposite in the value system of present day cultural criticism. That is, border language is now everywhere among us in current scholarship, and certainly on religious studies, one does not have to look far for representative titles. Two well-known examples are Daniel Boyarin's Borderlines, The Partition of Judeo-Christianity, and Sharon Kinoshita's very fine book, Medieval Boundaries, Rethinking Difference in Old French Literature, both from 2006. But these are, as you see, the tip of the iceberg. There is beyond religious borders, interaction and intellectual exchange in the medieval Islamic world, or crossing religious borders, or again, crossing religious borders a few years later on a new topic, or the big winner, the pithy crossing borders, which is an amazingly popular title. A quick search turns up truly scores of articles and dozens of books with this phrase in the title, including at least five books called Crossing Borders about the Middle Ages in the last 15 years. So I think it's time to freshen it up a little. Now I'm not calling the value or originality of any of this work into question, but something is trending here that I think we might try to make sense of. In particular, I find this regular use, and I actually don't exclude myself, I've done it, I continue to do it, of border language to discuss medieval religious culture and certainly religious change as prone to a presentist trap. I recognize some metaphor is needed here, and this one is very useful. It's heuristically useful, perhaps especially useful in the world of Iberia. But this metaphor of border crossing carries with it a host of conceptual dangers, certainly for the medievalist. Not only does it lend itself to further metaphors, such as intentionality, moralizing conversion as a kind of bold transgression across red lines or a taking refuge or a treason, it also succumbs to a particular risk that has been amply discussed in the field of political geography. What geographer John Agnew named in a 1994 study, the territorial trap. Agnew here defines this as a set of false assumptions made in discussions of political entities. And he lists three core fallacies that territories can offer us. First, state territories have been reified as set or fixed units of sovereign space. Second, the use of domestic foreign or national international polarities has served to obscure the interaction between processes operating at different scales. 
And third, the territorial state has view, been viewed as existing prior to and as a container of society. It is my suggestion that we can benefit from keeping guard from similar assumptions at, our, uh, at work in our own discussions of medieval sources. And we might actually, I can briefly can take a little divergence here. We might actually understand the importance of this question in, in a contemporary light by considering that border language is not innocuous. It is actually part of a larger global shift towards increased border wall construction. And just to consider briefly uh, the fact that the number of border walls that have been constructed since the fall of the Berlin Wall exceeds in kilometers the all previous known walls combined, including the Great Wall of China, plus everything else that they've ever measured. That is some 27,000 kilometers of border walls constructed since 1989, 22% longer than the Great Wall of China itself. There are border walls uh, in 60% of, let's put it this way, 60% of the world population lives in a country that has constructed a border wall. 60% of the global population. There have been 75 new border walls constructed in the last 30 years. So talking about borders is not child's play. Swapping out our amorphous, amorphous or vague notions of territory with equally vague uh, seemingly innocuous notions of identity, we might see that the potential of border metaphors, if not, is not, if not to kill us, it is to reify things as uniform and put space under sovereign control that cannot be uh, changed or reconceived by any other rational model. We might consider that borders are thoroughly deadly. That is, here's just a, a few facts about the number of deaths recorded just since 2014 uh, on known border spaces. So we should take borders seriously and not use them as a handy metaphor for what is actually an inappropriate idea or an inappropriate construction of what is a fuzzy idea. What we're doing is relying on binaries. In this case, inner outer, confessional ritual, individual collective, belief heresy, and so obscuring interaction between the porous and overlapping lapping scales of action. And we tend to produce an unwanted hierarchy of meaning in this language in which some aspects of religious experience, like sincerity or authenticity, are taken as more meaningful than others, like say, mimetic ritual action. In this understanding, the so-called sovereign self, like the territorial state, is seen as the primary vessel of religious meaning, the core site of conversion. Why should that be? In the political language of territory, the use of border language in religious studies can produce an artificial uniformity in which identities are assumed to be uniform across individual selves and homogeneous across religious communities. And in doing this, we historicize legal identities as if they were lived affective identities. So one is either Jewish or Christian, all Muslim or not Muslim. And so any hybrid identity, such as the child of parents from different communities or a believer who cherry picks her rituals or simply isn't sure what she believes, these are treated as somehow anomalous and somehow more interesting, which is perverse. Border thinking produces black and white dichotomies that allow for no natural gray zone and assume total uniformity within any given so-called border. Such thinking operates like modern cartography to maximize knowledge, accounting for all known space and leaving no phenomena as terra incognita. And as Hank Van Hedtum has noted, if the territorial trap is operational in political geography, it is all the more so in the cartography of movement, especially cultural movement. And this is what he calls the migration map trap. In his view, our ubiquitous map arrows indicating spreads and conquests and migrations and flows are complicit in flattening historical processes, in homogenizing populations and quote, translating ethnocentric worldviews onto political maps. And in a similar sense, cartographic metaphors can impose thoroughly presentist models of cultural change onto medieval scenes of contact, encounter, and change. And here, Jean Dangler, 
whom I mentioned before, offers us a valuable and welcome corrective in her emphasis on a network systems model of cultural and religious interaction. One she says is based on periodization, national or geographic bounds, or the place names they engender. It's a quote. But as welcome as this systems model is, it does not free us at all from the naming and fixing of the entities that act in such a network. And in so doing does not really help us escape the conceptual trap that is built into the metaphor by which identity and crossover are constructed. I suggest that the risk here of not working harder to avoid the conceptual traps that these metaphors offer us is quite serious. As Lakoff and Johnson explain, metaphors create reality for us, especially social realities. Metaphors can literally be self-fulfilling prophecies. So what do we do? How to avoid this pitfall in our discussion of Iberian religion? In political terms, Agnew argues that only historical geographical consciousness can free us from what he calls the dead hand of the territorial trap. Now in medieval studies, if we're going to try to avoid reifying fluid metaphors as universal categories, I suggest we impose a self-limiting paradigm, certainly with regard to religious phenomena, one that resists speaking of conversion or revelation or any theophany in universal, factual, or generically categorical terms. That is, historians should not attempt to analyze or write about conversion or any religious phenomena per se, but rather write about the discourses of conversion and so treat them that way. Write about metaphors as such and stop taking them as reality or indices of real things. So we can trace the protean ways that religious experience is constructed and imagined in the texts and images and refrain from imposing a larger transhistorical category or simply assuming implicitly that one exists. In this sense, this conclusion really just concurs with uh, what others have said, such as David Abu Lafia's call to quote, understand the medieval frontier using the political language of the time. But I suggest we extend it to other spheres, being mindful that border language is, as I've noted, not neutral. Recall Ricoldo's difference as distance metaphor. I think it's particularly inappropriate and distorting as a lens for, for religion because to speak of Iberian religious communities as having borders and to cast contact and conversion or translation or exchange or anything like it as a border crossing imposes artificial uniformity on individuals and communities and reduces the complexity of interactions to simple binary equations of change. The conceptual borders mapped out in the geography of salvation serve as imagined conceits and thus are not found, as Zada says, in being but in language. These discourses involving, sorry, enveloping the construction and disillusion of such borders are circumscribed by an imperial logic of domination. Yet they also point to the subversive power of translation and slippage in communication as a kind of veil, as he notes, that conceals as much as it reveals. Ultimately, Zada says, frontiers are epistemic in nature. They are used in the production of meaning, in distinguishing alterity through deictic acts of communication, and they do lead us from here to there. But we should stop trying to understand them in physical terms. So navigating around such traps of thinking and approaching religious phenomena as culturally specific constructions of metaphor and language, as I suggested we do today, we can see historical distance as difference, but also importantly, leave it alone, leave it as indistinct, and partly undefined. This path, I suggest, allows us to interpret medieval categories and metaphors with something like empathy and certainly something like humility, rather than through the imperious biases of our own modern mental geography. This path, perhaps, leads us back to a world in which terra incognita can still remain an inviolate marvel, a spur to the imagination and the soul and an unfixed and unbounded locus beyond which knowledge that intimates to us, in Zadar's words, uh, the sublime design of difference itself can never go. Thank you very much. <laughs>